Hello and welcome to the programme. In two days, May the 17th, it's International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, a day dedicated to the eradication of discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people, and how that discrimination is still rife in European society. A report to be launched on Friday by the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency surveyed almost 100,000 lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people to discover continuing violence, verbal abuse, hate speech and harassment. To steer us through the quagmire of issues, I'm joined now by Ulrike Lunacek, Green MEP from Austria, co-chair of Parliament's LBGT Intergroup. A very warm welcome. welcome. First though, th let's kick off with our habitual round of quick-fire questions, demanding a simple yes or no answer. Ready? Yes, I OK, am. let's play then. Ulrika Lunacek, alone the majority of people don't subscribe to discrimination or prejudice. Collectively, many people do forget their principles, yes or no? Yes. Do you believe the right anti-discrimination laws have been initiated by the EU? Yes. Is the situation better here in Europe than other parts of the developed world? Yes and no. <laughs> Should lesbian, gay, bisexual and transsexual rights become specific conditions in EU foreign aid, including in the Muslim world and sub-Saharan Africa? Well, yes, they are, in a way. Is there sufficient ethical and moral gu guidance coming from the church? No. Do you believe there's connection between social hardship, unemployment, for example, and discrimination? Yes. Do you see any advantage in the involuntary outing sometimes practiced by lesbian and gay rights activists in some European sometimes, countries? Sometimes, yes. Do you think there's more discrimination here, let's say, than five years ago? No. And just one final question. You were at a conference recently in Vienna on the United States of Europe. Are you for that? Yes, for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Yes. OK, that's time up for that uh, quick-fire round of questions. We'll return to some of these issues uh, later in the discussion. First, though, Ulrika Lunacek, I wondered if you could um, look at your own experiences um, in the fight uh, you know, for gay and lesbian people and tell me what motivates you. Well, I come from a con very conservative background myself, a uh, conservative country, conservative family, and, uh, but one that has uh, almost told me always, well, do what you think is right in a way. And I was asked, I'm an interpreter originally, and I was asked more than 20 years ago by the International Lesbian and Gay Association when it held its conference in Vienna in 1989 to do some interpreting for lesbians and gays from Latin America. And there, that was a time when there were still uh, very difficult situations for many people there. And so I sort of realized these people there are fighting in very difficult economic situations, in very difficult political uh, situations, sometimes being uh, persecuted by, um, by military, by police, etc., in a way that I hadn't lived here. So that is something where I felt, well, here in Europe, I can be freer to talk about what I am in this fight against the fear, the fear that many of us lesbians and gays have internally that we shouldn't tell who we are because we would be discriminated, but also the fear of a lot of straight people who don't know us uh, because they never have seen or visit the sort of um, um, really seen somebody they don't know about it that was something that really motivates me to fight against this fear okay let's hold that thought and take a short digression um, at this point to look at some of the key issues coming up next week in parliament's plenary session in strasbourg <laughs> Tax evasion, fraud and avoidance in Europe, not to mention tax havens, cost around a trillion euros a year in lost revenue. A vote is scheduled next week at Parliament's plenary session in Strasbourg on the fight against them. On the same day, MEPs will try to speed up banking union by voting on a common mechanism of bank supervision. The following day, the focus is back in Brussels as heads of state and government meet to work out ways to combat tax evasion. <laughs> Syria is on the agenda again. Tens of thousands of civilians have been killed and more than 700,000 refugees have been driven from the country in two years of conflict. The plight of the refugees in neighboring countries is to be debated and voted on next week. The EU's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Catherine Ashton, is due to attend. Three, two, one, and we're off. The countdown to the next European election is ready to start. Next Tuesday, plenary is to ratify the date. Millions of EU citizens are eligible to vote between Thursday the 22nd of May and Sunday the 25th. 
a bit earlier than usual, May instead of June, and not quite so many MEPs, down from 754, as it stands right now, to 751, including probably 11 MEPs representing Croatia. <laughs> Let's return to our main topic. Um, Ulrika Lunacek, legislation combating discrimination is getting tougher and more precise, especially in, in the European level, and yet public attitudes in many places remain intolerant. What, what do you think has gone wrong here? Well, there is not yet enough laws and anti-discrimination and also like in family laws haven't changed all over the European Union. So there's still space for people not to visibly or not to actively know lesbians and gays and, and to have their prejudices. And we also know that changes in people's minds and hearts take time. It takes not just laws, it, laws are extremely important as a parliamentarian, of course I say that, but it also takes publicly visible lesbians and gays who are out there in the world in business, in every part of the world, in the families, to really change people's minds and hearts. That's a longer struggle to be dealt with. But I have to say, I mean, we have come a long way, but things still need to change more. And if you look at the question of social mobilization and awareness building, are there any other things that should be done um, on a kind of social level rather than on a legislative level, do you think? Well, I mean, the, 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 the economic crisis we're living, of course, also has effects on LGBT people. Yeah? That uh, we're also affected by the way that, uh, that uh, especially for younger people, if it becomes more difficult to find a job, you are in a very insecure situation. And that doesn't make the, the will and the courage to be open about your sexual orientation or gender identity easier. So this, of course, also has an effect there. So the fight against the crisis and especially against youth unemployment is an important one as well for lesbians and gays. And you mentioned just earlier the desirability of new legislation, what legislation would you want to push through? Well, first of all, we need the so-called horizontal um, uh, anti-discrimination directive, which has been stuck in the council for about four years now. That needs to go on. That would allow for measures against discrimination on LGBT people, but also on discrimination because of age or disability in areas of services and access to services. Uh, and then we have been asking the parliament, I think about nine or ten times, we've been asking Commissioner Reading to go ahead with a roadmap against homophobia which would cover all areas also like discrimination in the area of health or really going for school books that would uh, be more open-minded and have visibly gays and lesbians in there that is something we've been asking her we hope she'll come forward with something like that looking at the wider picture are you worried about the presence of Christian fundamentalists who are opposed um, to many of the things that you're campaigning for operating in parts of Eastern Europe inside and outside the mm -hmm. EU but also operating in many other the parts yeah. of the world. Yes, for sure I am. It's not just Eastern Europe, it's also Western Europe, but it's not only the Christian fundamentalists. I think fundamentalists of any kind of religion are dangerous for equal rights for everybody, be it for women, be it for lesbians and gays uh, and bisexual and transgender people. Yes, there is concern and I think we have to be very concerned about them really rising also in, in being active against more uh, equal, in more equal rights. But as I say, it's not just Christian fundamentalists, it's all kinds of fundamentalists. And do you see these fundamentalists also operating within the European Parliament? Yes, there are some, I don't know whichever organisation, but there are some MEPs who come from a very religious background and I'm not saying that religion in Ireland is wrong. There's lots of lesbians and gays who are very religious. Yeah, their organization of religious uh, LGBT people. There was a former um, a Swedish uh, minister of the environment who was openly gay, who lives with his married husband and the, and the children, who is very religious as well. Yeah, But um, there are also in the European Parliament some who do not want equal rights to, to go ahead and that's something we need to, we need to stop and we need to enhance our struggle for equal rights. On, just on that question of religious institutions, do you feel that there has been enough ethical and moral leadership from religious institutions within Europe on this in the right sense? In the positive way, no. No, they are still, be it the Catholic Church, other Christian ones, be it the, on the, from the Muslim side, from the Jewish side, all the others, they need to be more, more open-minded. There are some in all of these communities, but they're not the majority, and I think there needs to be more struggle also from people, LGBT people, and support of straight people in these religious communities to really see that uh, God, if there is, or Goddess, has created all of us equal. And that has to apply to religious communities and to LGBT people as well. We've just got time for one tiny mm -hmm. question more. What's your message on May the 17th? Get out, be visible, be daring, be courageous, and convince 
the straight world that lesbians and gays are everywhere and will stay here and we want to live our lives free of fear. Ulrike Lunacek, many thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you. Hello, hello. hello. Hello and welcome. There's one thing that gets European blood boiling hotter than a kettle, ever rising energy prices. According to the EU master plan on energy, they should be coming down, with customers benefiting from greater cross-border competition and market liberalisation. But tot up the monthly bills and you'd be forgiven for complaining the opposite is the case. Why? What's gone wrong with this key component of Europe's internal energy market? I hope my guest, Philippe de Bakker, a Belgian MEP from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, will help us answer that. First, though, as we do with all our guests, a round of quick-fire questions in which you get to answer yes or no. Simple as that. OK, let's go. Philippe de Bakker, if consumers haven't actually seen the benefit of energy liberalisation in six or seven years, it's a failure, right? No. The idea that you can boil a pot of coffee in Brussels using competitive energy suppliers four countries away is a fantasy, right? No. Do you share citizens' alarm at the increasing prices in energy 30 to 40 percent in six or seven years? Yes. Have the energy, the big energy distribution monopolies of the past been broken down and we've seen a genuine opening up of the market? No. Major energy companies, as you know, were raided recently by the Commission on suspicion of price fixing. Do you believe these raids were justified? Yes. There is price fixing, you yes. think. Do you believe in, the, in any intervention, either on a national or European level, to bring these down? Yes. Competitive energy supplies for business is the key to economic recovery in Europe, yes or no? Yes. Are prices set to increase as ever more um, alternative energy supplies feed into national grids? No. Do you believe that, uh, that alternative energy is part of the answer to our energy problems in Europe? Yes. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, our time's up. Uh, we'll have uh, a bit more time to discuss some of those issues in more depth. But first, Philippe de Bakker, there are many shortcomings highlighted in a new report entitled Making the Internal Market in Energy Work in Europe. Briefly, how would you summarise what the key need is here to make this market in energy work? Well, I think, first of all, you have to look in this uh, energy uh, market in, in very long terms. Um, investments usually take 10, 20 years before they, they, they pay off. So I think what we first of all need is a very stable investment climate. And I think that will uh, make sure that the right investments, both in production but also in new distribution channels, are taking place in Europe. And I think this is really crucial uh, to make that happen. And in that respect, it will also create much more competition. And that will drive uh, uh, the prices down uh, eventually. And this is something that we haven't seen in the past enough. The liberalisation hasn't gone far enough, especially on the level of production but also on distribution. So there I think we as Europe should do more. OK, let's take, um, take a moment to look at a report on energy liberalisation right here in Belgium before we continue. This is prepared by my colleague Arnaud de Mouda. 19 degrés, c'est la température ambiante au salon chez les deux semettes, idem à la cuisine ou ailleurs dans la maison. Ce confort a un coût pour ce ménage bruxellois de quatre personnes. La facture de gaz et d'électricité est le troisième poste de dépense après le loyer et l'alimentation. L'année 2012, on a payé 2500 euros sur l'année de gaz et d'électricité. Donc ça nous fait, euh, depuis le début 2013, là, des factures mensuelles de euh, 246 euros. Donc euh, dans le budget, c'est euh, important. Au classement des pays de l'Union où l'énergie est la plus chère, la Belgique occupe la quatrième place. Depuis la libéralisation du marché opéré en 2007, le coût de l'électricité a augmenté de 30% et celui du gaz de 38%. Cela représente 450 euros supplémentaires sur une facture annuelle d'un ménage moyen. Le consommateur a payé au moins aussi cher durant la libéralisation que si le marché n'avait pas été libéralisé. Mais depuis 2012, le marché s'est dynamisé, notamment grâce aux consommateurs. Il n'hésite plus à changer de fournisseur, ce qui stimule la concurrence. Et ce changement de fournisseur, Nicolas Herring, s'en fait son métier, courtier en énergie. Bonjour Didier. Bonjour Nicolas. Ça va bien Ça va bien. Ça va bien. Tu viens un peu faire le, le point au niveau des, des rapports d'économie, ici pour, pour Tilien, un peu voir ensemble ce qu'on a déjà fait depuis le début du mois de novembre. Donc depuis novembre 2012 jusqu'à février, on a économisé euh, la somme de 3600 euros euh, pour la copropriété, donc sur 4 mois. Donc on peut estimer l'économie, si tu veux, sur l'année, même si ici on est dans les mois les plus froids, donc avec un peu de prudence, à 5000, 5500 euros 
euh, sur l'année, ce qui représente quand même 10 à 15%. Sur une année complète Sur une année complète, donc, donc 10 à 15% de la partie énergie. Dans ce cas-ci, la libéralisation a fonctionné. Depuis 2012, la partie énergie proprement dit d'une facture ne représente plus que 38% du total. Le reste sont les coûts de transport, les taxes diverses et surtout la distribution qui, elle, n'est pas libéralisée. On regrette de voir que depuis 2008, les tarifs de distribution sont à la hausse. Ça peut sans doute s'expliquer par le fait que les distributeurs sont détenus par les communes et que du côté des communes, on retrouve des connexions avec les décideurs qui adoptent les lois et les règles au niveau régional et fédéral. La plupart des États membres agissent de la sorte. Ils n'ont pas encore tous transposé correctement les lois européennes. Loi qui oblige notamment à séparer les activités de production et de fourniture d'énergie. Des mesures qui pourraient favoriser les consommateurs. Arnold de, de Mulder reporting there. Um, Philip de Bacca, despite the promises of lower prices, consumers in many countries, including here in Belgium, as we've just seen, appear highly dissatisfied. What do you think has gone wrong over the big ambition to liberalize the energy market in Europe? Well, I, I really understand some of the complaints by, by the consumers, but uh, we have to understand, of course, that liberalization could not happen overnight. It takes time. Uh, especially in the energy market, uh, investment cycles are 10, 20, 25 years long. Um, so liberalization, which started almost 10 years ago, still has to come into full effect. We still have to do much more to liberalize and create much more competition, especially in production, but also in distribution nets. And mainly that's where, where the cost is. Secondly, the prices of energy products are not only determined by the energy providers. There's all, also the commodities uh, which have gone up and down, a big fluctuation there, but also distribution fees and also taxes. Um, so the, The, the energy price which the end consumer is paying is a much more complex, complex process than only the energy providers. And if you accept that it has to take time and it's got to be given space in order to operate effectively, you also have to accept, uh, don't you, as you indicated in the earlier round of questions, that the big companies need to be actually policed uh, to make sure that they're not fixing prices. And yeah, also there you need much more competition. Competition is the best guarantee that the incumbents are driving their prices down. And for example, you, in Belgium, You have seen that last year was the first year that the incumbent energy provider had less than 50% market share and the prices have come down remarkably because of that the new players have come into the market. And what intervention do you think, if any, either on a national or on a European level, um, should be brought to play here in a free market environment? Well, today you see that the energy market is really a centralized market. Um, and I think that we have to, as Europe, make the step to a much more decentralized market. But of course, this also takes investments. So you need, first of all, to create a very stable investment climate for new players players to come into, for example, start investing in renewables. Um, also, historically, the incumbent players have, of course, a huge benefit because they have invested many, many years ago and they're now using the energy production capacity that they have at a very low price. Do you think we've broken down these, what were previously, monopolies? Not enough, and I think, therefore, the, the stable investment climate, but also something that Europe is doing now, for example, investing more in interconnecting the different networks through the Connecting Europe facility, for example. I think these are major uh, incentives to make sure that the, the energy market in Europe is really starting to function, much more competition is introduced, and we will see in the near future that this will really change the way that consumers are looking at energy prices. And do you think, then, that the consumer will be able to be offered at some point energy products that come from outside their country? Yes, I think that is really something that we need to do. And this is why it's so important that in Europe we really invest in this interconnectedness. Um, it makes sense to, for example, install solar panels in Spain and, for example, much more wind energy in, in, in the UK. Uh, and interconnecting all these different forms of energy will be crucial in order to, to become energy independent. Also. But they have to get around, first of all, the problem that there are huge differences between pricing and between um, standards of energy supply in different countries. Um, of Absolutely. Europe. And this is something where Europe can help. Eh? This is something where we can make sure that the framework of the energy market is such that it becomes much more transparent for consumers but also for people who are active in the energy market to make sure that they can do the right investments at the right time. Let's move on to what we touched on very briefly or what you touched on briefly about alternative energy sources. Do you think the, that Europe's 2020-20 carbon reduction uh, targets play into energy liberalization and are, going to, are consumers as a result of this going to see prices rise even further? Well, partly, of course, the investment that needs to be done in renewables will be significant. Um, so there will be a, a, a small effect on, on, on the price for consumers, but mainly also for companies. And I think there uh, we do have to be careful that we're not out-competing our own industry towards the rest of the, of the world. On the other hand, if you see today the price of, of a ton of CO2 is very, very low, so the impact of the CO2 reduction as such will not be that big.
Just a very quick question. We have 15 seconds left. Um, what do governments do you think need to do now in order to reach these 2020-20 um, targets? Well, we can really invest in energy efficiency, especially towards households, new new buildings, for example. But also the transport sector has to do a, a, a really an effort to, to, to come forward for the 2020-20 goals. OK, Philippe de Bakker, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. And thank you also for watching us.